And the first talk is an invited talk by Miguel from Google, who's going to be talking about bringing FHE to production. Lessons learnt at Google. Over to you. Thank you. Um, can we pull off the slides? Okay. Thank you. So, hello everyone. I'm Miguel. I'm a product manager at Google. And what that means is that my job is to try to bring uh, new privacy enhancing technologies pr to production. And I've been working with the FHE team within Google for about one or two years. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the lessons that, uh, that we've learned uh, when we try to convince product teams to use FHE. Um, I'll start with a slight diversion. Um, I started working on this field when I uh, started working on differential privacy. Uh, you don't need to know much about differential privacy other than it was invented around 2004. It's this mathematical notion of privacy that quantifies how much privacy is lost every time that you execute a certain computation. Um, and I think that, uh, that the lessons of uh, differential privacy make me hopeful that eventually we'll get to a point at Google where we can use FHE in more applications. Um, but it was a long road. Um, it was, I started working on, on this project uh, on around 2016, and it took us probably about two or three years to get to one client that was willing to use differential privacy. And once uh, that client wanted to use differential privacy, it was way easier to, uh, for more clients to onboard. Uh, recently, we launched an application that's live in 1.6 billion devices. It's probably the largest deployment of differential privacy, but it took us a long time. And uh, some, of the, um, some of the lessons that we learned, uh, you'll see, are somewhat similar to what we've seen with, uh, when trying to bring FHE to production. Um, first of all, when you had uh, to create a differentially private mechanism, one of the most common um, uh, ways to do it is by adding some sort of noise distribution. And when you tell a client that you're, that you're going to introduce noise into their data set, that just creates an antibody reaction in them. They don't like the idea. Um, the, the second problem is that some of the results are nonsensical. Uh, we had a team that was uh, measuring uh, minutes of that people were watching certain videos, and some of the results were negative. So the data scientist was freaked out when they saw that there were ne negative uh, minutes of watch time. Um, the third uh, challenge is that it's not very straightforward to set up. Uh, there are some hyperparameters that you need to tune. They're not intuitive and they create uh, weird, uh, they, they make the data to be shaped in weird uh, manners. Um, the fourth challenge is that it's uh, significantly slower. Uh, in some cases, I I we, were, we were just trying to, to help a client over the weekend that uh, was trying to run a query and the query was 40 times slower and they were crazy about it because the regular query took 40 seconds to run and the query with differential price, it took about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and then um, the fifth challenge is that people need to move from this uh, deterministic frame of mind to a more probabilistic one. Um, when people analyze data in the differential privacy field, they assume that the result is exact. And when you start thinking in terms of differential privacy, you need to start thinking in terms of confidence intervals. And you'd assume that is not shouldn't be hard for a lot of people, but it turns out that it freaks out many pe a lot of people. Um, so, in terms of what we've done on FHE, if you don't know, uh, we launched um, a, a transpiler that allows you to add FHE to an existing application. One of the things that we learned early on was that um, if we wanted a team to switch to FHE, then we needed to have uh, PhDs working with that team just to build a single feature, and we felt that was not feasible. So we were trying to do something different, and we launched the transpiler about uh, one and a half years ago. Um, one, as I mentioned, a challenge was uh, ease of use, but the other challenge that we've seen is uh, speed. Every time that we tell people how much it will take to run their program with FHE or their feature, uh, then the conversations generally stop because it's just unfeasible. Um, on the other side, um, there are incentives for people to use these privacy enhancing technologies, and the story with differential privacy is very similar uh, to what happens with FHE. Um, GDPR is a regulation that was enacted in Europe about four or five years ago, and it adds some privacy guardrails, um, and that has incentivized some people uh, to use uh, differential privacy and now FHE. There are other countries that are doing the similar things, uh, so there's now more pro uh, global privacy regulation, but I think what moves most teams at Google is the increased privacy awareness that the users have and that it becomes a real incentive uh, for them to at least explore the idea of using privacy-enhancing technologies. 
Um, so my job primarily is to try to find uh, a team that is the right fit for, uh, for FHE. Um, before I go into more details, um, I've been thinking about this concept of the Pareto optimality. It is a concept that comes from economics, and the setting in economics is that you have two different uh, players. Uh, one player, these two different players have two utility functions, and the point where these two utility functions meet is called the Pareto optimality line. And I think that if you think about FHE or the way that the clients are, uh, that I talk to think about it, is that yes, they value privacy and they want to do something good for, uh, for the users and therefore they would like to try FHE, but the cost is too high. And what you see in the green line is the cost with FHE and what you see with red is the cost without FHE, uh, broad in, in broad strokes. Um, and I've estimated based on my conversations that if we get to a point where FHE is at most 10 times more expensive than a regular or the baseline computation, then teams might be able or internal clients might be able to, uh, to at least start thinking about using FHE in their applications. Um, unfortunately, we're very far. Uh, what we tell them is that it's typically a thousand times lower. And you can imagine that if a service uh, costs $2 million to run, if you suddenly run it with FHE, it's $2 billion, which is a lot of money, so no one is willing to spend that much money. Um, however, one of the interesting insights is that we found, uh, we found applications where the slowness of FHE is actually not a big problem. And I'll give you a few examples. We were talking to this team uh, that has to deal with a customer request that comes through a call center. So um, you can imagine that a customer calls and uh, to the call center is waiting for 20 minutes, then they get a hold of someone and it takes another 20 minutes to solve their problem. So in this case, the tolerance of the application is 40 minutes. So if you can do something below 40 minutes that with FHE, uh, that reduces the amount of time that a user needs to wait, then that's, pot that's potentially a, f uh, a use case that a team might be willing to do. And that case was uh, surprisingly easy. Um, it, was the, it was the first one that team was trying to do embedding comparison, which was a very simple operation. I can't remember how long it, it took with FHE. It was probably one or two minutes. Uh, so that was, a, uh, that was a potentially good application. And uh, we found other applications. There is this team that tells us that they're trying to turn on end-to-end -end encryption into their service, and they want to provide transcriptions uh, to their users of what happens uh, in, in the meetings that, 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 that they have. And it turns out that the clients don't believe that Google is providing end-to-end -end encryption. So what the client team was telling us was that if they turn on FHE and the transcripts take probably 12 hours to process, that's actually a selling point because in the client's mind, the fact that it takes so much to process actually demonstrates that there's some magic happening in the background and therefore the meeting must be encrypted. So there have been all of these like really interesting um, effects that, that we've been finding out as to when we're trying to, uh, to add FHE into things. There was another team that was wanted to do very simple image processing uh, for their application and that was something that was also doable um, in a short amount of time. Um, this was uh, what I was referring to there when you turn end-to-end -on end -end encryption, some uh, features go away, blurring is a feature that goes away, uh, so the team wants to turn on blurring, so they're exploring to do it with, uh, doing it with FHE. Um, other features that go away are th uh, things that you can do with uh, machine learning models, so for instance, if you, if you want to do inference on, on, an, encry on an encrypted uh, example, then uh, you could potentially do it with FHE and it's not that slow, so the team is actually considering uh, to do it. But there are other things that people want to do. Uh, they've asked us if we can do a real-time video processing and the answer is no, we're very far away from that. Um, so in terms of what's next for our team, um, one of the things that I keep uh, telling uh, the engineering team is that we, should really need, we need to focus on reducing the computational overhead um, at the moment, it's been very hard to find these very niche applications that I talked to you about. We've talked to many, many people, and, uh, and it's been hard to find those applications. Uh, but I'm convinced that if we reduce the computational overhead to a point that's more amenable uh, to the majority of our client teams, then those teams might, uh, might consider switching to FHE. Um, on, since we're not there yet, and probably we will not be there <laughs> in the next year or two, um, then what we're trying to do is just to work, talk to a lot of internal teams to see which one might have a good application that can be done with FHE. Um, however, the applications that we are anticipating will probably have are going to be very simple. Uh, that embedding comparison one was a very simple one. 
Um, probably if you see an application coming um, from Google with FHE, it will be very, very trivial. Uh, but I think that the goal that I have with the team is that we need to get to that first client. Similar to what happened with differential privacy, we need to prove internally that the technology works. At the moment, when, you, when we go with teams and present them this magic, no one actually believes that it works. There's a lot of hesitation. So uh, my, uh, my biggest concern is trying to get to the, that first client to demonstrate that it works in production at Google scale with Google's infrastructure. And my hope is that after that, it will be easier uh, to get more clients. Um, so uh, we also want uh, finally to find ways that we can use uh, FHE in combination with other privacy preserving technologies. Um, uh, one example, um, not of FHE, but of uh, HE with MPC is that when you have two parties that are computing things um, separately, but some of our lawyers told us that even though you're comparing things separately um, and no one has access to the under underlying data, that does not prevent uh, or th that does not reduce some of the compliance risk because at the end of the day, the outcome is very precise. And so there is some privacy that's been leaked by just the fact that that computation has been executed. Um, so one interesting idea that I don't remember if, if the team actually implemented it was to add differential privacy on top of MPC uh, to make sure that whatever is computed after the fact is not leaking privacy in a way that, that, that is not consistent with privacy regulation. Um, and then, uh, this is my suggestion. Uh, someone was asking me in another talk that I was giving the other day, like what uh, should people be focusing on? Um, again, what I tell the team, uh, in our, our internal team all the time is something very similar to what I'm saying here, which is like really reduce the computational cost. Um, I do not think that if the cost continues to be so, uh, so high, there will be a lot of applications. Maybe there will be some very niche applications or some very simple applications. But I definitely think personally that there's a lot of power in the idea of FHE because it turns on its head the, the, the way that people think about data. At the moment, it feels like, like an unavoidable trade-off that to use a service, then you have to hand off some of your data to some server. And I think that FHE turns that idea on its head and it's very powerful because it will change the way that people think about data. Um, but we're far away from that, and I would love to get to a world where actually that, uh, that vision is a reality, and we can provide more secure services to people without having to ever decrypt their data or, uh, or having to put it in a server uh, in plain text just uh, to compute things. Um, so that's it. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you. Some of the best quotes of the conference so far were in that talk. I kind of was tweeting the ones I could remember. <laughs> so, do you want to come up? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Um, can you speak towards uh, your uh, experience with regard to using FHE for collaboration with like other companies and some sort of uh, like like any sort of collaboration between two companies that uh, drive some sort of business insight uh, and the benefits you could have there? Because there, it's more like making something totally impossible possible instead of like making it faster or slower because usually companies might not be willing to share data but uh, if using this, these technologies they might be willing to. So uh, can you speak? Uh, yeah, you know, um, that's very interesting because when, um, when we uh, launched our version of MPC probably four years ago, uh, the assumption was that there were going to be a lot of use cases in, uh, in that uh, very similar to what you're describing. Uh, but what we've seen is that those ca cases are very limited to uh, to specific uh, specific niches. If I don't remember, if I remember correctly, most of those use cases are limited to ads uh, companies with whom Google works that want to preserve their data in house and then need to preserve do some computation um, with uh, with HE. Um, when we launched this, we actually thought that the technology had many more potentials because we were thinking, well, what if Governments across the world are trying to join their own data sets with other data sets that a private company might have, and this leads to all sorts of public benefits. Unfortunately, we haven't seen much of that. We've, uh, we've uh, done a roadshow with, uh, with government entities, and it hasn't really uh, picked up. Um, but, uh, but I'm still hopeful that one day there will be like, more applications like the ones that you're describing. Um, so following on, perhaps, so I was going to ask about, I know you've 
Google have done MPC with the ads in this world. Have you looked at applications of FHE within that kind of ad ecosystem? Um, because you can kind of think of some, some MPC applications use HE as like an accelerant. So you can actually make the MPC go faster because you use a combination of MPC and FHE. Have you kind of looked at those applications within Google yet? Um, we haven't directly. Um, the ads team, um, the ads team, it's, it's very funny because they really care about um, efficiency and it's, and every time we go and talk to them and we tell them that we're going to mess up their thing, they, uh, like, they say no, 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 no. So, um, so, so, so I think uh, it's been hard uh, so far to find those use cases. Yeah, but the ads already use MPC, yeah, in, in some parts. For some applications. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, in the bits where they still, they currently use MPC, have you looked at oh. using FHE within that bit to make the MPC go faster? You know, this goes back to what uh, what I was saying earlier. Um, we, a lot of people, when we talk to them, they think that FHE, it's, it's just like an over promise and that it doesn't work. So it, we're facing an uphill battle in trying to demonstrate to them that it that could actually be beneficial to them. So I think that's why we're like, I'm very interested in getting to that first client to demonstrate that it actually works in Google's infrastructure so that we can go to more clients and hopefully tell them you can do what you're doing better. We'll take that, we'll take that one offline. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, Pascal. <coughs> Thanks. Um, so with your transpiler, everything is a Boolean circuit. Yeah. Do you think this is the right approach long term? Very you know, simple question, <laughs> maybe very complex to answer. I don't know. Uh, actually, I mean, I, I, I cannot answer uh, that question. Um, I would suggest you ask that to Shruti, who's over here. Um, I'm still, I'm still haven't delved very deeply into the technical details of FHE, um, so I, I would defer that to Shruti. Okay, there was someone over. Are you allowed to use open source, or do you have to build everything from scratch? Uh, no, we're allowed to. Uh, this is something uh, very, uh, very interesting. Um, we're allowed to uh, use open source modulo some things. Uh, so we were trying to use Concrete, and I, I don't remember the details. So, so let me see if I remember them correctly. Concrete was using a library for FFT that was licensed on not under Creative Commons, but under another license that that basically says that every derivative product of that library has to be open source. So uh, the, when our lawyers saw that, they said you cannot bring concrete into Google Free because that's gonna taint the entire Google code base. So yes, we can use, uh, we can use, uh, we, can, we can use open source and we're more than happy to use open source. Zruti and I gave like a big fight with the lawyers to try to convince them otherwise. We were not successful. But typically, if things are covered under Creative Commons, we're more than happy to use it, and we can use it. If it's not covered under Creative Commons, like our hands are completely tied, and we've fought that battle many times, and we've lost it many times. To, to complete a little bit and elaborate on what you're saying, it's true. Uh, FFTW was a pain in the ass for, for concrete, of course. Language. Language, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so we finally got rid of it. And with TFHE.RS, which is like the successor arc of Concrete Core and Concrete Libs, basically, because it supports like um, um, other operations, like all the operations we know uh, how to perform with TFHE, there is no such licensing problems anymore. So it, it's really something that we, it took time for us to go to that point, but it's done. And it's uh, more efficient as well. It's more efficient than FFTW. So Thank you. We're happy. A lesson of academic code bases polluting <laughs> commercial code always happens. Any other questions? No? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. That's really cool.